We're going to start service. Put your hands together. We're going to take out that song. Hey, every knee shall bow. Come on. Here we go. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. I can't stop. I can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising the name. this evening church sing it out every knee shall bow here we go every knee shall bow every tongue confess jesus christ is lord forever every knee every knee shall bow every tongue confess jesus christ is lord forever i can't stop no i can't stop Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising the name of Jesus, and I can't stop, no, I can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising the name of Jesus. More love, more power. Give it up. More love.
You, you 
move, but only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Cause you can make the chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Hey. Oh, yes, church, lift up your voice tonight. Let them know that you love them. Oh, Jesus, we worship your holy name. Amen, church. As we open up tonight in prayer, uh, we have one special request. If you could pray for Mike Trejo for healing uh, in his body. And if you could just continue to pray that God would continue to speak throughout this week of conference, amen, that it would be a time of refreshment, a time of edification for our missionaries, our pioneers, and also our very church here in McAllen and your church as well, amen. Tonight, we also want to pray for Pastor Ruby, amen, that God's hand of anointing would be upon him for tonight's message, that he would bring a word in due season, Amen. From God that would speak to everyone here. And as we go before the very presence of God, Pastor Joe Albert from Baltimore, Maryland is going to come and open us up in prayer, church. Let's lift up our voices tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, God. Oh, we pray that you would move mightily in this congregation and throughout this conference body, God. Pour out your grace tonight, God. Ori Oh, yes, Father God, we come before your throne tonight, God. God, we need your hand upon this conference, upon this service, God. Oh, we are believing for handfuls on purpose, God. God, pour out your spirit in this fellowship, God. Have your way upon hearts, my God. Even as of now, you would stir the hearts of men and women, God. We need, God, your favor, God. We need your dominion and breakthrough in our lives, God. We are asking, God, for your anointing upon Pastor Ruby, God. As he ministers your word, God, I'm asking you would quicken hearts, God. You would bring a witness, God. Oh, a confirmation about decisions, God. And we are leaving, God, this place with victory tonight, God. We are believing the God of miracles in our city and in our lives, God. And we come before you, God, lifting up this service, God, giving you our hearts, God. And we are asking that you would have your way. And all God's people said amen and amen. Amen, church. You may be seated tonight. We want to welcome you tonight to our Wednesday evening night of conference. Amen. Glory to God. Yes, it's been a wonderful time. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just have some announcements. Uh, very quickly, and that is tomorrow morning prayer does begin at 8 a.m. here in the main sanctuary. So please, uh, let's be on time. Let's be punctual here for prayer. Uh, if you want to fellowship, we do have the front foyer and also the one in the back as well for that and the hallways. But the main sanctuary is dedicated for prayer, amen, so that we may get a hold of God. And then the seminars will begin starting at 9 a.m. in the morning sharp. Tomorrow we have the following lineup is Pastor um, Rafael Vasquez, Pastor Gilbert Vidal, Pastor Brian Castillo, and in the evening, Pastor Joe Campbell, amen. Glory to God. 
With that being said, tomorrow night is our Thursday night, and that'll begin, um, well, we have, the service begins at 7 p.m., the video is at 6, and then prayer is at 5 p.m. in this building. So prayer at 5, video at 6, service at 7. And also, if you do plan on planting a church, please get the names and the place to where they're going to pastor as soon as possible. Please don't wait till the last minute. Um, if you already know the moves that are going to be taking place, please get that to pastor as soon as possible. And lastly, uh, we just want to thank everyone for your cooperation. Everybody throughout you know, this week has been a tremendous blessing. We are finally in a flow and a rhythm, so thank you very much. You all may give yourself a hand of applause for that. Amen. And we have multiple ways of giving. We have our online giving through uh, the doormcallan.com. We also have the convenience of a church app, which you can download under the Door McCallan on the Apple and the Google uh, store. You can also text the word conference to the number that is on the screen uh, that we'll be showing here in a couple of minutes. And for Thursday night, you can uh, text the word WE for World Evangelism. We also do take checks under, made out to the door. Amen. So that will be a great blessing. That's all the way we have an announcement. We are going to hear some reports on what God is doing in our pioneers, in our missionaries' churches. We're going to hear a video report from Pastor Nidier Aragon. Then immediately after the video, each pastor is going to come, uh, give us their name, their wife's name, and tell us what God is doing in their city in three minutes or less, they will come and testify in this order. Pastor Genaro Nava, Pastor Rafael Vasquez, Pastor Isaiah Trevino, and Pastor Gabriel Flores. Amen. Let's go ahead and show the video here for Pastor Nidier. Amen. Hola a todos. Eh, espero que se la estén pasando muy bien. Eh, yo soy Nidier Aragón, este, mi esposa Flor y mis hijos Elena, Emanuel y Deneb. Nosotros fuimos este, enviados de, de la iglesia de Monterrey a, a, a las ciudades de Reynosa, Tamaulipas, de las conferencias de aquí de McAllen el año pasado. Nosotros llegamos aquí a la ciudad un 26 de julio del 2022. Este, desde que llegamos, pues llegamos este, hablando con las personas de Dios, evangelizando, este, haciendo estudios bíblicos, todo ese tipo de cosas. Este, pues luego, luego que llegamos en la ciudad pues se, se presentó oposición ¿no? por ahí por, un, por unos momentos ¿no? Yo, y este, pues ahí tuve un detalle con una persona que era el crimen organizado entonces este, pues fui a orar por él porque pues él me lo pidió Fue unas personas que, con las que oramos ¿no? para salvación entonces este, pues le di mi teléfono y me, me llamó para orar por él entonces ahí este, se estaba drogado y pues como que hacía ahí brujerías, santerías, entonces este, según él me quería matar y después de eso y pues ahí, este, ahí pasó algo interesante, ¿verdad? Pero pues Dios es bueno y Dios nos protege, entonces este, empezamos a buscar, bueno yo empecé a buscar trabajo, eh, pues pronto encontré trabajo y, y pues este, con el favor de Dios, ¿verdad? Este, también ahí en el trabajo, eh, con el aspecto con, con respecto a que pues puedo o tengo la libertad de poder este, salir a la hora que yo quiero este, con la confianza con, con mis jefes entonces este, pues Dios es bueno por ese lado este, hemos visto la mano de Dios ahí también en las finanzas pues este, cuando llegamos pues yo no estaba trabajando entonces me estuvieron apoyando este, un tiempo ahí con, con, con lo personal verdad entonces, este, pues gracias a Dios, ahorita Dios ya se movió, este, proveyó pues, mucho más de lo que necesitamos. Entonces, este, yo creo que estamos mejor cuando estábamos allá en, en Monterrey. Entonces, Dios se ha movido poderosamente. Este, eh, eh, quisimos que, que este video hubiera sido desde un local que pues, íbamos a adquirir, pero pues por una razón o por otra no, no pudimos adquirir ese local. Entonces, este, como quiera seguimos este, nosotros buscando locales, este, estamos creyendo que Dios nos va a dar un local este, muchísimo mejor que el que íbamos a, a tener. Entonces, este, al momento de que tengamos ese local, este, yo siento de Dios de que pues, va a haber un crecimiento grande, ¿verdad? Entonces, este, pues mi mensaje para, para 
todos, es que todos aquellos que quieran salir, pues que lo hagan, ¿verdad? Que no tengan miedo, Dios está con ustedes, este, Dios se va a mover, ¿verdad? Si ustedes están pues, este, haciendo la voluntad de Dios, ¿verdad? Como tal. Este, y pues quiero agradecer a mi pastor, simplemente estoy siguiendo pues su ejemplo, ¿verdad? Agradecer al pastor Román. Este, y pues Dios me los bendiga a todos y pues una disculpa yo por la tardanza con el video. Dios los bendiga. Ah, y el próximo año ya vamos a estar ahí este, con ustedes en, en las conferencias. Eh, bueno, Dios los bendiga. Praise God, aleluya. My name is Genaro Nava, my beautiful and patient wife, my two kids, Jason and Julia, were pioneering in the church there in Brownsville, Texas. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We are out there tilling the ground, house to house outreaches, street preaching, park outreaches. You know, you know how you establish your street preaching corner, and every time we get there and we're uh, walking to the corner, uh, the car is already honking, you know, they know we, we established dominion there. Recently, we moved to another street preaching corner, and we just seen a, a supernatural move. People have just been uh, uh, coming out of those uh, outreaches, and uh, we want to thank God for moving uh, uh, through those outreaches. Uh, particularly, there was a young man that came to one of them as we were street preaching. He said, you know what, I saw you all last week, and I was hoping you guys would be here this week, and we were. And he got in, he got saved right there. We prayed for him. You know, he's here in conference uh, tonight. Glory be to God. Uh, during the year, we did have Jeremiah Wacker come, Richard Valerio come and do tremendous jobs, gave uh, words in due season, uh, gave uh, notable uh, miracles happening with uh, past uh, evangelist Richard Valerio. Uh, exciting, exciting things are happening. Richard Valerio, at the last night, he prophesied. He said, you know what, uh, in a couple of months, you're going to see uh, uh, people come into the church, and they're coming in. They're coming in. We're seeing fruitfulness from our outreaches, from especially from that revival. Uh, we just had a Jesus people wedding uh, in uh, February. We married uh, Seth and Mariah, and they're here as a couple. Come on, somebody. That's huge. And we have another one on the way. My daughter, it's bittersweet. She's getting married also in September, and so another one is coming. Also, we had a trunk or treat for uh, Halloween, and uh, man, we saw a lot of people come on out. We weren't, you know, you expect a lot of people to come out, but we didn't have enough things to give them out. Everything just finished. Everything, which is a good thing. It's a good thing, you know, our church ro uh, rose up. They did a puppet ministry. Uh, people got saved. We also had a back-to-school bash. Also the same thing. We saw the people come through, get saved, get their life to Jesus. You know what? Google has really helped us out. If you're not in Google, if you don't have your church in Google, it's very easy to set it up. And so I've had a lot of phone calls. People just come by and say, you know what, I saw you on Google. You were the number one. And so I came to your service, and I thank God for Google. And before I have, uh, time runs out, I want to thank my pastor, uh, uh, Sister Nora, for your exampleship, Pastor Ruby for his leadership. I want to thank you guys. Pray for us in Brownsville as we take Brownsville for Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. First of all, I want to say thank you, Pastor Roman, Sister Nora, Pastor Ruby, for your leadership. Amen. I want to uh, say thank you to Pastor Brandon and Valerie. We took over the church in the beautiful city of Edinburgh. Amen. And uh, I'm not forgetting my wife. Amen. She's always there for me. She's, you know, there, my, my helper, my, my support, my everything. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I just, uh, my three kids. My three kids, Jasmine, Kevin, and Kaylin. Amen. We're pioneering the church. And we took over the church. Amen. Again, in Edinburgh, Texas. Amen. Uh, real quick, amen. I know Joey told me, hey, you better hurry up. Yeah, but it's okay, Joey. I'll give you a hamburger after this. Amen. Uh, praise God. As soon as we took over the church in Edinburgh, man, we start having a uh, revival with Jeremiah Walker. Timely revival. Word in due season. He started, you know, giving words to people. He bring a word for the church in Edinburgh. Uh, three months later, we took over the church May uh, 15th. Three months or four months later, I remember exactly, we started having uh, serious men. I started noticing that there were a lot of men in the church. I said, you know what? There's men. We need to have serious men. Amen. I learned that from my pastor, from this church. Amen. We started having serious men. So uh, we already have MP9 with new preachers in Edinburgh. Because I believe if we have men, we can send couples out. How many can say amen? 
pre- I'm not preaching. I'm just sharing my testimony. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, we were having uh, uh, movie nights. Amen. The preachers are leading that. Amen. We're having a, uh, you know, a street preaching. People are getting saved. Amen. There in the street. We're taking uh, Dominion and the, and the university and sugar. God has been moving. We're, uh, you know, having a, a movie night, concerts, worship, uh, worship concerts. Even Kevin lead one of the concerts, amen, and people's responding. We're trusting in God and we believe in God that God is barely starting in the church. That God is going to take that church to the next level. Amen. God has been moving. God is in control. Again, Pastor, I want to say thank you for your leadership, for your prayer church here in McAllen. Thank you for your support. Amen. Thank you for your prayers. Keep praying for Edinburgh. We keep praying for you guys too. God bless you. How's it going? Testing one. Hi, um, me, my name's Isaiah, me and my beautiful wife, Mikael, my three kids. We pioneered the church in Kansas City, Missouri. It's been a year that we've been there. Um, after a few months, I got a little bored. I was like, we can start having Bible studies at our apartment. So we started doing that. Amidst of that, we get a phone call from a couple. They were uh, at, in the China, one of our China, uh, churches in China, sorry, fellowship. And so what happened is their pastor started a different church in Cambodia. So uh, they give me a call. They say we're coming this way. The, the guy that, that they're, they're engaged, they come over, and he's from that area. So they call me. They say, hey, we're looking for a fellowship church. We're like, hey, we just got here. Perfect timing. And uh, we, they come in. I find out they're engaged. I say, we need to get you guys married. So we, have a, we get them married. They get married, praise God. We get them filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, they've been just a big blessing with us since we've gotten there, a big support. Amidst of that, we understood we need a building. We want to start going out. And so we started looking around. And one of the first buildings I had seen, I said, that would be a good building. And I kind of put it off. We tried to find something within different areas, maybe a different price. I come to find out that building ended up getting purchased. So I'm like, oh, I'm, that building's gone. And so as a barber, uh, we have a client that came in and... Um, He's like, hey, uh, how's your church thing going? You know, um, uh, I was like, oh, it's going okay. I was like, we haven't got a building yet. He's like, okay, I was just about to say. He's like, I just purchased a building. I was like, oh, where at? He's like, well, um, here, this look. He's showing me a picture. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, but it's bought. He's like, no, no, I bought that building. But the thing is, I want to split it. I want to share the other half with you guys. I know you guys need a building. I was like, dude, praise God. So, um, I, I was rejoicing, but I also wanted to find out how, how much is it. He's like, well, it's going to be about 2400 a month. I was like, oh, I cannot do that. And he's like, no, no what, what can you do? And I called my pastor. I was like, what can we do? And he's, <laughs> he's like, we, let's, let's, let's try for this. And so, you know, my pastor is good at all this. So I'm like, hey, you know, my pastor said this. No. And he's like, you know what? He's like, that's perfect. That's fine. Utilities will be included. I just want to help you out. I, I know what you're doing. I'm, I, 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 I see who you are. And so God, God's really helping us. We've been going out, starting to uh, pass out flyers and going out and trying to evangelize the area now that the weather's kind of changing. And we're, be, we're really beginning to see what's going on in the community. There's definitely the alphabet community and a lot of other uh, stuff going on there. But we're going at it full force. We're believing God's going to help us. God's been doing a new thing in us. We just see God building us, building his church. We're excited for all that God wants to do. I encourage you guys, if anybody wants to go out there, we're, we're ready to help, uh, help us outreach and uh, do the all God wants to do. And uh, other than that, do pray for us. We do have a revival coming up next month with Jeremiah Wacker. We're believing God for good things. I do want to thank Pastor Ruby. Thank you, Pastor uh, Roman Gutierrez, Nora, Pastor uh, Yolanda. Thank you guys so much. Wessico Church, thank you so much. Good evening, amen. I was just, my name is Gabriel Flores and my beautiful wife, Leslie, my two kids, Nolan and Layla. We pastor in the great city of Detroit, Michigan, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. So just a, a couple things after conference last year, you know, we just got situated into our building. And, you know, it's so funny. We just moved on the other side of the street and we have so much more foot traffic now, people popping in. 
and noticing that there's a church that's been there, you know, since Pastor Jalber was there. And so God's been bringing visitors, amen, and there's just so many broken people, lost people. Michigan needs churches, amen. There's more churches in the valley than Michigan, just putting that out there, amen. And uh, so, but God's been helping us. We had a revival with uh, uh, Richard Valerio, amen, and after that revival, it really stirred our core, our church. You know, we were able to start a song service. From that, we have guitar, bass, drums, piano, amen, from that. They were stirred. They're getting more involved, outreaching, street preaching, and, you know, uh, from that, you know, we, we have uh, movie nights, uh, concerts. You know, we don't have a lot of people in our church, so I rapped. Moving on, all right, so we, amen, believe, just believe in God, amen, I just wanted to, you know, just encourage the church, you know, no matter what you can do, even what you can do, amen, God can use us and God can help us, uh, you know, we had a, a disciple, amen, get saved uh, earlier last year, right, uh, before we came to conference, he's locked in, got baptized, amen, he's here with us, uh, tonight he's been helping us, amen, <laughs> glory to God, we had another uh, a gentleman, amen, just move. Uh, across the street and he's a he's a veteran he's an amputee and he found our church as soon as he moved he's been coming faithfully amen he walks to church with one leg even in negative degree weather amen he's hungry desperate for God and we're just uh, so grateful for that amen and uh, just this last month we've been having so many visitors just come in get saved amen and then this one last uh, story is you know last year uh, you know, last year after conference, you know, we're street preaching, and uh, we one of the days we had a uh, debate, uh, intellectual debate, amen, I won't say argument or altercation, but we had this debate with this man, he was an atheist, he was saying, man, what you guys are doing is not going to work, I live here, uh, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing, and you know, so we just uh, brush that off, amen, and wouldn't you know, last month he comes into our church, amen, you know, not believing God, and God is moving, amen. There in Detroit, amen, I just want to thank my pastor, Pastor Roman, Pastor Ruby, your leadership, Sister Nora, amen. I want to thank you guys in McAllen Church. We really feel your prayers there, and we covet them, and keep praying for us as we win Detroit for Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Amen, I am uh, here to receive the offering. You know, uh, I was uh, born in California, don't hate me. And um, uh, as a kid growing up, uh, one of the highlights of, of being a kid was uh, going to Disneyland. And, uh, you know, when we were, you know, very small, probably four or five, first time our, my parents uh, took us there. And, uh, you know, it was always kind of a highlight. When I got to be a teenager, I moved to Arizona by that time, I had an uncle who lived three blocks from Disneyland. And I would uh, go, my, I have a cousin that we're the same age, we're pretty close growing up, and I would go spend summers with him there in Anaheim, California, and uh, would walk to Disneyland, spend a lot of time there that time period. And, and some of you uh, that are older might remember that, probably went there. And one thing about Disneyland, they have different uh, areas, different parts of the park. One of them was Tomorrowland. And back in those days, when you would go back in the 70s, I mean, when you would go to Disneyland, it was futuristic. I remember being in the carousel of progress, and they would show you how technology has changed, uh, and then go into the future, and they would show you these jet airliners and airports and how they would run in the future. I remember they showed that one day you'll be able to record tel uh, programs off of a television, and it was like, that's incredible, you know. That, it was hard to imagine. You'd go there, and they had all these different things that they did. They, at and had a place where you would go, and they actually had, listen to this, speaker phones, where you could have people talking in a group chat together. Like, whoa! You know, who can, I, I know you young people are like, what are you, what, what's this old man talking about, you know? and a monorail that went around. And, and the thing is, and so when you went there, there was a sense, this is the future, that it, it brought hope and excitement. How many know Disneyland's not that way anymore? Today, it's become uh, a, uh, uh, a lot of other things uh, that have gone on there. It's become uh, narcissistic. There's a strange, perverted, underlying that word, obsession with self. And, and it no longer represents something in that Walt Disney's vision was that uh, when people came to this park, they are going to be optimistic about the future. 
That's what he was selling, optimism. That you're going to feel good, that we're going somewhere, we're advancing, and it's no longer that way. You know, it is possible to lose your tomorrow. And I want to read you one verse, 2 Kings 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a say of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two sayas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Now, I want you to think about that verse for just a minute because there are two people there and two people who have two different tomorrows. There's somebody here who says, you know what, uh, by tomorrow. Now, the backstory: story, uh, that Samaria has been besieged by the Syrian army uh, and they have cut off the water supply into the city. They have surrounded them. Um, they have brought with them an abundance of supplies because their plan is to starve uh, these people out of that city. Uh, and so they have brought food to survive uh, in there for six months. They're filled with their tents, they're loaded with food, and they're there. We're going to stick it out, and, and we're going to break you by simply starving you out. And sure enough, by the time this happens, uh, they're already resorting to cannibalism. It's a horrible, horrible moment. Uh, and it's if this moment uh, that you find two people, uh, somebody who looks at tomorrow, Elisha, and says, tomorrow, blessing's going to break through here. It can't come from outside the gate, but it will come from heaven. God is going to step in. He is going to move. Uh, and there's this man who is full of optimism. I believe that optimism or hope should be the mark of a believer. Can you say amen? amen? That if you believe in Jesus Christ and you stand by this book, then you have hope. Doesn't matter what's going on right now. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. The Bible says one day he's breaking through the clouds. You know what we call that? The blessed hope. That it doesn't matter. We can look at the political situation. We can look at some of the things that are happening. Did you just catch that? And uh, the head of the European Union last week said that uh, you can no longer spend more than $1,000 cash in any one time. That's the limit you can spend. They, they're clamping down. They're trying to remove currency. The word is that it won't be a few months before America does the same thing. All that money you have buried under your mattress, you're going to have to figure something out. In other words, the world's changing. Things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. But you know what? I'm a Christian. I have hope in God this evening. I know God is in control. Remember, Paul is in his chains, and they bring him to stand before a judgment. And he says, I have hope in God. He's a prisoner in chains. I have hope in God. And Elisha says, do you know what? By tomorrow, my tomorrow, what he's saying is, my tomorrow's in God, have hope. Things are good. God is going to move. He's going to help me. He's going to move in my situation. I understand that morning uh, happens in a night, but we know that joy comes in the morning. Something is going to happen. God is going to help us. Uh, and we know that when the children of Israel were captured and dragged to Babylon, that God spoke to Jeremiah, sit down and write a letter to the captives in Babylon. Uh, and he says those words that we all know and love. Uh, and that is, he says, uh, that the thoughts that I have uh, towards you are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. He wrote that to people that had been dragged away and enslaved in Babylon. And he, God said, I want them to know that they still have hope. Because it doesn't matter where you and I are, we have hope. Then you have the other man, the officer, the deputy of the king, who when, El when Elisha says, by this time tomorrow, this man said, no way. This man said, uh, you know what, even if the windows of heaven open, might this thing be? It can't happen. Here's the prophet of God speaking a word from God, and yet, uh, how many know there are people that will hear that? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And he makes that statement, even if the windows open. He says, it's almost mocking God that even heaven doesn't have enough to help us. God can't get me out of my situation. I'm stuck. And I know that every time that I stand and I preach or every time I take an offering like this in a great Bible conference, that I'm speaking to two different people. I'm speaking to Elishas that say, Pastor, I have hope. And I'm speaking to people that say it can't happen. And where this manifests is in our giving. People who give, give because they have hope. The Bible says we sow in hope. 
We have confidence. The farmer gets up and he gets his sack of seed and he goes out and the Bible says he sows in hope. He's dropping a tiny little seed small enough for a bird to, walk, to come in and eat and fly away, but he does it anyway. Why? Because he's motivated by hope. And then there are always the people who say, I cannot give. I'm checking out of this offering because I don't believe things can change. I don't believe God can get involved. Years ago, I remember reading a story about Flagstaff, Maine. This was a town in uh, a small town. It was nearby a certain river. And what happened, this was, I believe, in the 1950s, the state government gathered together and they wanted to make a dam. They had to make a dam and they determined to put the dam in a certain place. And when they announced that, that meant that that river would be caught or captured and the water would overflow. And the residents of Flagstaff, Maine were told, uh, within five years, uh, your city will be underwater. Everybody's going to have to move away. And they gave them a couple of years to pack up. People had lived there for 100 years. Families had been there for 100 years. And now, all of a sudden, the little town that they loved and they took care of was told that in a couple of years, it'll be no more. And what was interesting, a sociologist thought, this is an interesting study. And so they wanted to see what becomes of a people and a town that knows it won't be around for a few years. You know what they said happened? It said that they stopped painting the buildings when they needed painting. They stopped picking up the trash. They stopped mowing the lawns. There was no hope. There was, there was no reason. Why pay taxes? Why contribute? Why serve? Why care? Because there's no, it's, it's no hope. I want to tell you, when, when you and I lose hope, we stop serving. We stop giving. We stop caring. You can be in a conference like this, in this atmosphere. Uh, to me, just listening to these young men give testimony, I'm telling you, man, it just does something for me. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, dear God, look what God has done. But I want to tell you, you can be in here hopeless unmoved. I want to tell you this is very, very important um, because what we really are saying when we have hope is I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. And the natural man looks outside the gate and sees the Syrian army surrounding. They look inside and there's no water. They see the horrors of starvation and what it does. You want to pay attention, read the, about the siege at Stalingrad, you can, you can read about these kinds of what happens when there's no food. It's horrible. And yet, here they are. And when Elisha said it, this wasn't just, you know, uh, Tony Robbins hype. This isn't the, the power of positive thinking. He said, I still believe in miracles. I believe that God can do something. And that man knew exactly what he was saying. Even if the windows of heaven open, God can't do it. I want to tell you, we are people that believe in miracles this evening. You know, when I was in Armenia, uh, I was really fascinated there uh, uh, because, you know, of course, there's Mount Ararat and, and all of that. But, but one of the things they tell you when you're there, the guy that picked me up, I'm asking him questions, and he says to me, well, the reason... Uh, uh, he, the, he, you know, I told him I'm a Christian. He goes, well, we're, uh, Armenia is the first Christian nation in history. And I, I was like, really? I, I had read a little bit, and he said, yeah, well, he started to tell me, and then as we're driving by, he says, two of the best whiskeys in the world are made right here in Armenia, in the great Christian country of Armenia. <laughs> Pastor Sergei Golubov said, the Armenians were Christians before Jesus even came to the earth. But the story that I decided to read about it was very interesting. I'm going to have to hurry and tell you this, but you know, what happened is there was a king in Armenia, and this man uh, was, uh, had enemies, he had an opposition, and there was a man who had come and gotten close to the king, gained his trust, and he assassinated him, and they captured him and killed him, and he had a son. And so they were trying to kill the whole family, so the people took the, the little boy and they chased him, they took him off to Turkey and hid him in Turkey with some people there so he wouldn't be killed because his father was an assassin. That little boy was raised in Turkey, and you have to understand this is not long after the Apostle Paul had been to Turkey. 
And he ended up being raised a Christian, becoming a powerful Christian, born again. And he decided, to, when he became old, his name was Gregory, to go back to Armenia and preach the gospel. So he began to go into Armenia, began to preach. Uh, he began to uh, reach into uh, the, the royal family, um, and God was helping him. God was, and then somebody, somebody said, you know that is? That is the son of the man who assassinated your father. He told the, the new king, the son, your father was assassinated by this guy's father. So they had this man arrested, and they put him in prison, and they were going to put him to death. And what happened is the king got sick. And when he, Gregory heard the king was sick, he said, before you kill me, give me a chance to pray for your king. And he prayed for him, and he got powerfully healed. And the king was so moved that in 300, I think 301 AD, he declared that the entire kingdom of Armenia was a Christian nation, the first Christian nation in the world. You know what that means? It means you never know what a miracle can do and how a miracle can change things. Miracles are game changers. And Elisha's saying, I, hey, folks, I still believe in miracles. You know, I was thinking about this. In May of 1982, Yolanda and I are courting. We're, we're, um, we're engaged to be married. We're going to be married that August. And in that, uh, there was a Bible conference. Mike and Mary Webb were announced to get sent out to Pioneer in Salt Lake City. Mike and Mary were friends of ours, you know, and, and I remember here we are, we're, we're a couple of 19-year-olds and we're going to be getting married and uh, we had saved $500 for our honeymoon and we were there, well, actually about $506 and uh, we're talking and we said, you know what, uh, we had, you know, we're getting married, you know, you got to, you know, uh, you know, my ring, I still got my ring from 40 years ago, it cost 30 bucks. Don't get in debt. Getting, anyway, so, uh, but, but I'll tell you something. We said, let's do this. Somehow, let's just do this. Let's, God will take care of us. And from that time, I was just thinking how many times we've sat in Bible conferences and we said, let's just do this. Times when we wanted to buy a home and we had saved all this money for the home and, and then here we are and we're like, let's just do this. Because something is, is there, there, there's hope. You know, what we're really saying is there's hope. God's a miracle worker. God, let's see what God will do. You know, there are stories that I'm not prepared to tell people that are so deep and so profound, rooted in a conversation with my wife where we just said, let's just see. I want to encourage you tonight. When we stand and we give, it's all about God. I believe. I believe. I believe. I don't know how it worked out, but you're a miracle worker. God. Who knew it would be four lepers? Who knew that a, a spirit of fear would be sent upon the Syrian army? Nobody knew. You know what they knew? God is still God. God is still in control, and he knows exactly what he's doing. Let's bow our heads because that's what we bring into this service tonight. Listen, folks, if we don't have hope, the best preacher can do nothing. If we don't have hope, great music will do nothing. Our hope, our hope isn't in men. Our hope is there is a God in heaven. Windows do open. He can do what you and I can never even understand. But we bring to an offering, I believe. I want to tell you, you have to have those conversations. And say, God, you know what? I'm facing something right now. I can't pay for it. I couldn't raise enough money to solve it. But God, in my giving, I am saying I have hope. Father, I ask you to help us right now by the grace of God in this place. I thank you for this is a miracle. We are standing over a testimony of what you have done by your power for your glory. God, I pray tonight, fill this congregation with hope. Let it manifest in overflowing liberality. God, we believe that you are a miracle-working God, and I pray for everyone here right now 
right now they need a miracle. They need a miracles of healing, miracles of grace and restoration. They need miracle money. And God, we give in faith, knowing you are able to meet every need. Bless this offering tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, church, as you're liberal this evening. I'm going to sing out that song, I Feel the Spirit Move. Here we go. I feel the Spirit moving, and that's all right. I feel the Spirit moving, that's all right. I feel the Spirit moving, and that's all right. That's all right, all right. He built me with the Holy Ghost, and that's all right. He built me with the Holy Ghost, that's all right. He built me with the Holy Ghost, and that's all right. And that's all right. He wants me of my reticence. That's all right. He wants me of my reticence. And that's all right. That's all right. All right. He took away my loneliness. And that's all right. He took away my loneliness. That's all right. He took away my loneliness. And that's all right. Amen. Thank you, musicians and ushers, for that ministry and platform workers. Hallelujah. You know, the truth is tonight uh, is when I think of a godly, faithful, anointed man, Pastor Ruby is one of the first that comes to mind. You know, he's a, uh, a spiritual giant to me, and I'm sure all of us that are here. And I've seen him minister throughout the years, you know, all throughout the years. And one thing is for certain is that he is a man who has been constant. Amen. He is a man who's been constant, even from my childhood years, my teenage years, and even until now, apparently I've, I'm now a man, according to Pastor Ruby from yesterday. <laughs> I'll take it. Amen. He's a man that has been unwavered. You know, he's a spiritual grandfather, uh, not only to myself, but to all of us that are here. And not because of age, but because of heritage and wisdom. And uh, when your grandfather speaks, you listen. So let's give Pastor Ruby our undivided attention as he ministers. All right. Watch out when they start introducing you as grandfather. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to go there in the Word of God. And I've really enjoyed the fellowship. Uh, spending time with your pastor and uh, the, getting to go out with the men and just see what God is doing. Uh, it is just a real joy, just an exciting thing to see this right here. And as I said last night, this is a seed of what I believe God wants to do in this place. And so um, thank God for that. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And so I, I, uh, when I, I mentioned this thought, we have a prayer, uh, our Saturday morning overcomers prayer. And, 
we do a little, like a little five, 10 minute devotional and I, I did this first in that setting and I stood in front of that a group of people, there might've been 25, 30 over there that morning and I said, uh, my name is Richard and I'm a Raider fan. And then they responded, hello Richard, like we were at AA because uh, uh, alcoholics and Raider fans are pretty similar. And um, I have, a, because of that, I, I, I recognize that I have a bias. Now I know I'm here in cowboy land, and, uh, but I have a bias in me, uh, which of course I believe that Jim Plunkett was the greatest quarterback that ever lived, you know, and the Raiders of course are the greatest team. Anyway, I better stop right here. See, I thought you'd be rolling in the aisles laughing by now. But one of my biases had to do with an athlete or a football player that played for the Raiders. His name was Bo Jackson. How many are old enough to remember Bo Jackson? And so uh, this guy was incredible. In fact, probably in, in my lifetime, he would be uh, pro probably the greatest athlete of my lifetime. But, the, but I made the mistake. I like to read. I, I read a lot of books. And I decided to read up on Bo Jackson. And when I read, about him, it wasn't as my memory was. And I actually uh, really disappointed me. And so when I was reading about this guy, it, it, he's an unbelievable life. His, his uh, time, his career, which was basically in the 80s and early 90s, was a snapshot of incredible moments. If you were looking at a photo album of, of, of Bo Jackson, you would look and you would see things about him, uh, his incredible athletic feats, you know. Story goes that he's in high school and he's just walking uh, uh, after football practice and they were having track and field practice and uh, the school high jumper was trying to jump over uh, uh, the, uh, the, the high bar there, which would have been the school record, and he keeps missing and missing. Joe, Bax Joe Bo Jackson never high jumped in his life, and he runs over there and just breaks the record and begins to be the school high jumper. He, they, they tell him to join the, the, the decathlon, 10 events, you know, that you participate in over two days. And, and this guy, you know, they give him a javelin and he throws it unbelievably far the first time, picks up a disc, just whoosh, sends it everywhere, taught himself how to pole vault. And then when he went to the state meet, he was so far ahead that he didn't have to run the last uh, event, the 1500 meters, and he hated long distance. He didn't have to do it. He was so far ahead. They'd never seen an athlete like this. He loved baseball more than football. And uh, there are these stories about him as a baseball player. They said that one time he was playing right field and say he hit a foul ball. And in this particular field, there was a very short distance between the foul line and a fence, a five-foot fence. And Bo Jackson ran over there full speed, caught the ball, and then jumped over the five-foot fence. And everybody in the crowd like, stood up to look at him, and he knew they were looking. So he just stood from a standing position, and he jumped back over the five-foot. That brother could jump. One of my favorite stories is he was playing a baseball game when he was at the University of Auburn against the University of Georgia in Athens. And it was the very first time that they actually had night ball. They had just put up brand new lights. It was the first night game ever at the University of Georgia. Bo Jackson came to bat. He was already a football star. And there at the University of Georgia, they had a, a, a great running back named Herschel Walker. And so uh, they believed Bo Jackson was like trying to take over Herschel's position uh, and uh, fame. And so when he came to bat, the whole crowd was cursing him, booing him, uh, giving him a hard time. And Bo Jackson hits the ball and he hits it so far, it goes all the way and he hits the lights and bounces back to sh the shortstop. And that same crowd that was cursing him stood up and gave him a standing ovation. I'm talking about like, a, like he's a cartoon character. But for all the things that Bo Jackson did, he never won. When I began to read about his life, I began to realize that all he had was a collection of incredible possibilities, incredible potential, but in the end, his teams never won. If you go to the record books, you're not going to find any uh, career statistics rivaling some of the other great baseball players or football players, all we have is a collection of incredible stories and that's it. Now I want you to hold that in your thought and I want to mention another guy that was a contemporary of Bo Jackson. His name was Michael Jordan. 
No, Michael Jordan was born only two months after Bo Jackson. Hey, you want to hear an interesting fact? I was born October 1962. Bo Jackson was born in November 1962. And then Michael Jordan was born a couple months later. All, four of, all three of us were born within four months of each other. Go figure. I don't know if that means anything. But anyway... Here's Michael Jordan, two months younger than Bo Jackson. And Michael Jordan, as we all know, also had incredible natural talent. He had this ability to jump. He had a coordination. His hands were so big that he could grab a basketball and throw it like a baseball. He had all the same, or maybe not the same, but he had incredible physical attributes. But the difference between the two is that Michael Jordan was an unbelievable winner. This guy won a college championship. He won six NBA championships. Uh, he is, uh, holds many, many records. Uh, and it's not because he could jump high or because he could run fast. Uh, it was all the other things. Like Michael Jordan was the first one to practice and the last one to leave. He had an incredible desire not just to uh, gather uh, stats or to make highlights on ESPN, but to win. Um, and he demanded of himself and anybody who played with him uh, that you're going to give 110%. And here are these two men. Bo Jackson, on the other hand, even though he was an incredible baseball player, when he went into the major leagues, if you know anything about baseball, it is the most skilled sport. Bo Jackson, when, what you do when you play baseball is when the season's over, if you're a young player, you are sent off to Puerto Rico or you're sent off to the Dominican Republic or down to Panama, and you've learned how to play baseball. You learn how to use your feet and all, and he had no time for that. He's Bo Jackson. He would never go. He never wanted to do the work to become what he could have become, the greatest. I want to tell you, beloved, that has meaning for you and I tonight. Because the problem sometimes is we stay only with what we're good at. And we never dig deep to what we could become. I want to preach a sermon called Hidden Treasure, Deuteronomy 8, verse 7. It says, the Lord your God is bringing into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Father, I ask you right now to help us. God, I pray that you stir men and women, to go the extra mile, to go beyond where they are right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you, first of all, about surface treasure uh, tonight. So here are the Jews on the border of the promised land. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' farewell sermon, they're standing on the border when they're about to uh, uh, go in, and Moses is giving them this final instruction uh, Nearly 500 years have passed from when Jacob had left that land um, and gone to Egypt. Um, these people have lived in tents. Um, they have been slaves in Egypt. Uh, they don't know anything about having homes. They know nothing about having their own property. Um, and here's this wonderful promise. You can go back two chapters to chapter 6. Uh, and Moses had said by the Spirit of God, so it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which you swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. Uh, and so he says, listen, you're going to go into the promised land and you are going to, there's, you're going to find beautiful cities, you are going to find homes already built, your wells already dug, plants uh, and everything that have already co been cultivated and you're just going to walk in and you're going to enjoy this. Imagine after 500 years, uh, you're going to walk in into a ready-made house, well, plants, wonderful blessings coming. In my mind, I, I, I don't know, I think they might have the pictures, but I thought about uh, our, our bread.
Catherine and, uh, and the people of Sri Lanka when the president was forced to flee. And I don't know if they have that picture there where they show them filling the palace and all these people. There they are filling this palace of uh, options. These people have nothing. I've been to Sri Lanka many times. They have nothing. And there they are uh, looking and, and entering into this. The second picture is our friends, the Taliban, when uh, Biden uh, ran away. There they are kicking back. I don't know if that's how they looked when they entered the promised land. But uh, this idea that they are stepping into something they didn't have. They, this is, this is uh, beyond what you and I can imagine. Um, God says, I'm going to, you can take the Taliban down, by the way, you know. <laughs> All they had to do was simply obey him. And God says, I'm going to bless you. Now, the parallel passage was our text where he says, I'm bringing you into a good land, brooks of water, fountain springs uh, that flow into the valleys and hills, wheat and barley, uh, uh, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey. Um, and he begins to describe the same land, but he says one thing differently than in chapter 6 that is our focus tonight. Uh, he says, a land whose stones are of iron and out of hills you can dig deeper. So here's the same promise. But he says something, you are going to find in the promised land blessings that come quickly, but the real blessings are under the surface. There are things that you're going to enjoy and they're going to come to you and they're going to come fast. But he says, listen, the real treasure is underground. Let's think for a minute about surface treasure. I thank God for the things that God has done quickly in our lives. You know, I've made an observation over the years that most Christians will tell you that most of the change in their life happened within the first five years of their conversion. Many in the first two or three years. They come in, they're lost in sin, they have habits and addictions, uh, they're uh, isolated, uh, they, they have all these uh, emotional hang-ups, uh, they're lonely, uh, they're introverted, uh, and they get saved, and they begin to enter into the house of God, and they get rid of all their druggy friends, uh, and they begin to come to church and meet different people, uh, and they get influence for the first time in their life. Uh, there are people that actually care for them and love them. Uh, they uh, uh, have a pastor, a pastor's wife, uh, leaders in the church that are actually providing covering over their lives. Uh, God God's beginning to restore them, begin to give them dignity. Uh, they begin to find that God wants to use their life. Um, now, instead of uh, uh, pushing drugs, they're preaching Jesus. Uh, and, and, and this radical change takes place in their life. How many can say, Pastor, that's my testimony? That is what you and I contend for, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But here's the danger, church, is that's the stuff that comes quickly. Just like when they walked in, uh, the walls of Jericho fell, uh, victory over Ai, the, the, the longest day, and they defeated the five kings of Canaan, and all of that. Uh, and the next thing you know, they're walking into houses they didn't build. Uh, they're drinking water from wells they didn't dig and eating fruit from plants they didn't plant. And all these things that God is beginning to do in their lives, uh, and it's happened quickly. I want to say something to you tonight. Everybody here has certain things that come easy to you. Everybody here, we have natural giftings and abilities in our life. And they're not all the same. There are people here, you're intelligent. And some of you say, that's exactly right, Pastor. <laughs> you're intelligent, you're, you're quick, your mind is quick. You, you figure things out, you, you're, you're quick. You, can, you know, they're the smart Alex, they're the ones that always so anyway, but uh, they, you know, there are people that, that not everybody's like that. And they're, they, they're quick to learn. They, they're naturally intelligent. Uh, and uh, thank God, I'm glad that, that you're, you're that way. And then there are people here that you're very athletic. There are some people that are incredible athletes. It doesn't matter what they do. They just have that ability. Their music, as you listen to these musicians and people that, 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 that can just play every instrument, you know, and, uh, you know, they just get on the piano and, and it just comes easy to them. This is true for people who sing. 
There are other people that they have, a, they're in, extroverts. They're just, they have a dynamic personality. They, they have the ability to engage people, uh, they talk to everybody. Uh, they can work a room. They can do all of that. Uh, then you have other people, they have mechanical abilities. Uh, you know, when something's broken, you know, you give it to them. These are the guys that were taking apart the iPhone when they were four. And uh, they, just, they just have, and, and what I'm saying is that everybody here has stuff we're good at. To us, it's like walking to a house, drinking from a well, uh, and eating a, a fruit off of a tree. It, just, it was there. It, 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 it wasn't hard. It's easy for you. Some of these things are not easy. Do not ask me to draw something. I would just as soon run across the freeway than to do anything artistic. The reality, beloved, is all of us have these things. But the danger is many people stop right there. That's, that, that's their comfort level. It's what they're good at. It is what comes natural to them. It's not evil, it's not wrong, but it's surface. And in my opinion, one of the things that happens sometimes is people get to a point where they get that, uh, they got, they're using their gifts for God. It is why a church can, like McAllen, can pull off a Bible conference because everybody has located their gift and they're serving in their gift and you're able to do this uh, conference and that's a wonderful thing. But what I'm preaching on tonight is that oftentimes we figure out what we're good at and that's where we stay. It's what we could call the service blessing. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, I read you that verse, houses and wells and plants. But the verse ends with the words, when you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord. Or in other words, you and I can be satisfied to operate in our natural talents. And that's as far as it goes. Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm good to pl just play the guitar. I'm good to have pastored or pioneered a church here in Texas. I am good. I have a nice, comfortable church, you know, that people like me most of the time, uh, and uh, everything's okay. I, I'm good. You know, I, I, uh, we have a Bible conference. Obviously, you all know that. And it's amazing to me how I watch men who, you know, they, they were eager to get sound, and, they get, and they're out, and they're, and they're beginning to do, get a little bit of success, beginning to get a little bit. Of, and, and it's like uh, they've already decided that that's it. This is as far as it goes. They have eaten and are full. And they have no idea of what's under the surface. Let's talk about hidden treasure. Because I want to tell you the real wealth is under the surface. The richest people in the world today and the richest uh, companies in the world today are mining companies. People who are involved in natural resources. The richest man that ever lived was John D. Rockefeller. He owned 80% or controlled 80% of the world's oil at one point in his life. That's how much wealth he possessed. There's a man named William Randolph Hearst that was the most powerful journalist in America. He controlled American media and all of that because his father was simply a man who was a miner who went out west, he showed up in California, and there were so many gold miners he left up, and he went to Nevada, and he discovered silver, and the wealth that he had uh, took seized control of American media for 50 years. Because the real wealth is not what comes easy to you, it's what you don't understand is beneath your feet. Let's think about a few Bible scriptures here tonight. Matthew 12, 35, the Lord Jesus says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. In other words, the, th the stuff that's down here, that's where the treasure is. The Apostle Paul said, Corinthians 4, 7, uh, this morning one of the brothers used this verse, but we have this treasure, there's that word again, in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And finally, one more, Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and 
hid and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. So he's not talking about a treasure chest, he's talking about a mine. Property that had to be purchased because there was something underneath, there was a treasure there that nobody else can see. And I submit to you tonight in this great Bible conference, hundreds of people here, many, many men who feel called to preach, pastors, evangelists, that there is treasure in you that nobody sees. That your greatest wealth, perhaps you're not even operating in it yet. That right now you may be doing this for God, you may be doing that, and that's cool. All I'm saying to you is, have you ever considered that there's so much more God has for you? But it's hidden. And if you're satisfied to just have a house, have a well, and have a, you know, have a yuruka, and, uh, you know, just, I'm good. You know what, you're not going to find this on an IQ test. You're not going to discover this taking the SATs. How do you test devotion, heart, and attitude? Solomon said these words in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. Well, here's the wisest man that ever lived and said, you know what, here are these natural talents, swift, strong, wise, understanding, skill. And yet Solomon says, for all of those things, there's something more that has to do with success and ultimate victory. It's beyond your natural talent. It is beyond what you are naturally good at. It goes way beyond that you have personality or you know how to preach. What a challenge to us this evening. Let's dig deeper tonight. You know, think about this statement. You're going to be able to find that in those mountains are copper. And from those rocks, you're going to be able to get ore. Now, you know, I, my grandfather was a copper miner. He lost his lung in the copper mines. And I was raised, when I moved to Arizona, that the mines were a big issue. My, my wife's family, they're from about 30 miles south of Tucson. And the main industry down there is farming and mining. I want to tell you that a couple things about mining that maybe you're not familiar with, you know that, that the deepest mining pits in the world are copper pits. To be able to access, you have to go way, way, way down to be able to gather that. In other words, God says, I have put in my, my promised land, I have put incredible wealth, but you're going to have to go way down there and get it. They don't have the modern tools that we had today. They were going to get that copper uh, and they were, going to, they, they were going to have to go way down there and get it. How do you get ore out of a rock? The only way to do it back in Bible days was by creating massive furnaces until that rock got so hot the ore separated from it. What I'm saying to you is it was there but they had to work for it. It wasn't what came easy. Many people would be much more satisfied to be able to just say, no, I'm good. I don't want to go that extra effort. I don't want to have to dig that hard. I don't want to have to put myself in that place. I'm good right now, pastor. If we don't push ourselves to go deeper, we settle for far less than what God has for us. We settle. This is wonderful. And this is glorious. But how many know 10 years from now, there's so much more God wants to do? I preached last night about my brethren and Russian brethren and what they're going through. And one of the things I came away with and I began to think about as I was so moved by that experience was that that incredible year, and it's still going on to this day, has changed them. 
And I realized when I began to ponder this verse is what's happened is that has made them to dig deep. And when they dug deep, they found some things they didn't have before. That life and circumstances that brought them to a point, and they have decided I, we're, we have no choice. Some of them have had to kiss their teenagers and send them off to another country. And out of these experiences that they're going through, they, they had no, we have to do, and they found something. And you have to ask yourself would they have ever found it otherwise? Or would they have just been satisfied? Hey, I've got my 40 people. I get to preach, get to do a little travel. You know, we, I was in Vietnam. I had the privilege of taking Yolanda with me. We did this incredible rally. I want to tell you, Vietnam is where it's happening. I went to China in 2011. We had three fellowship churches there. When I went, we did that rally. We had such a tremendous time. Within five years, we had 33 churches there. And I want to tell you that that same thing is happening right now in Vietnam. It's happening in Vietnam. And God is moving very, very powerfully. And I was there. There, We have couples there, you know, and, and I was watching them. I mean, who you're in Vietnam, you know, it's a third world country. It's illegal. They could easily be found, their passports taken, and told you got a week to, to, to leave. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching them, looking at Chris and Danielle Rugg now, you know. And the only reason they left Vietnam is because she couldn't have a baby. That baby would not have lived. And we had to evac her out of that country and take her immediately to the hospital where Jonathan was born. And that little baby spent almost a year in the hospital. I remember Yolanda and I would go over there to visit, and there was Danielle with that tiny, tiny, that little baby could fit inside my hand like this for a year. And I'll never forget the day they called to say, we've got a green light. We can, as soon as the doctor said he could travel, they called me and said, we're ready to go back. And the grace and the blessing, and there's a dominion on Chris. There's a dominion on him. As he's there, we had 20 people come down from Manoa to this rally. And I want to tell you something. Say, what, what, where did that come from? Did that come from having a house and a well and a garden? Those aren't the natural gifts. Those aren't the things that come easy. I'm looking at Eric and Roxanne. You know, Eric, when he got saved, he was one of those, man. He was a Mustang or a Maverick. There's stories about Eric. You know, he says, I can tell him, but I'm not going to tell him. Let's just say it involves SWAT, the SWAT team. But, uh, you know, but to see them function now, confidence in the ministry. And, I, and you realize, okay, how did that happen? You know how that happens? Go live in a third world country. Get stuck there during a pandemic. Couldn't come home for four years. You start digging. You start separating ore from rock. You start discovering where the copper is. Rudy Bonilla just got there. His wife just had the baby as soon as they had the baby, and there they are now. They're laboring and ministering there. And, and I'm watching this couple. God's helping them. They already have something powerful happening in their lives, in their ministry. They already have a, an immediate church that's come together. And, and I'm looking, this guy's from the south side of San Antonio. There we have a couple of south siders here tonight. And, and to see them, they're just kids. These guys are in their early 20s, and they're, and they're there. And God's helping them and using them. And they're learning how to function in this environment uh, with a brand new baby. And, and, and I'm looking at this, and, and this verse is on my mind. And it becomes clear to me. You, you, oh, everybody, oh, no, pastor, I want those resources. I want to tap into that. You know, uh, pray the next level in some religious cliche. You don't get this by somebody laying hands on you. You have to put yourself in that place. You have to decide, I'm going to go deep. There's something in you that says, you know what, do I want to stay here? Am I happy here with all my personal needs met? Because that's really what he's saying. All your personal needs will be met. But I have more. 
if you're willing to go get it. You know, I'm blessed here, and one of the, my personal gratification is just to be able to come here. Last night we went out with your pastors and with uh, Pastor Garza and Yolanda and uh, Rito and Dora. You know, these are from our church. I've known these guys since they got saved. And to see them, they're not just they're leaders and the influence and the impact of their life. And sometimes, you know, people have asked me, hey, what was it like when they were in your church? And well, they weren't like this, I can tell you that much, you know. <laughs> but here's the truth. They would never have become the men that they became if they had stayed in our church. They were a great blessing there. But they had to leave to discover what God had for them. And I have a word. There's some men here that you're, you know, they had to leave to dig deep. You will never realize what you may become until you put yourself where you have to dig deep. You will never realize what you could have done if you do not put yourself into that arena. Go ye into all the world, Mark 16, 15. Preach the gospel to every creature. And it says they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Very simple equation. Go, they went, and the Lord worked. We all want God to work. Go, they went, and God worked. You have to put yourself in a place where you have to dig deep. Do not retire, brother, because you're 25 years old. Do not settle when you're 40 years old. Don't say to yourself right now, you know what, I'm doing good. You know, Eric Barrientes, you know, Eric, Eric's always good for illustrations. You know, he, I remember he was doing well. He had a great church in Houston, and I pulled him in. He came to me at a conference and said, you know, I'm open. I'll go anywhere. And uh, at that time, we couldn't do it. I said, Eric, I'll, I'll, a year later, he comes back, and I said, Eric, do you want to go to Vietnam? A year before, he said, I'm ready. I'm open. I'm willing. A year later, he comes back, or I call him in. There's an opening in Vietnam, and he says, well, Pastor, uh, you know, I, things are going really good. I've got men I'm discipling. And I said, wait a minute, Eric. Last year you came in here and told me that you wanted to, uh, you wanted to go overseas. He goes, then he said to me, Pastor, I've decided I'm not going to go overseas, but I'm going to send men overseas. Great line meant nothing. Nonsense. <laughs> he left my office, comes back 10 minutes later, and said, I need to talk to you. He said, Pastor, God just spoke to me. He said, my, you know, his father was, did three tours in Vietnam, Marine. And he said, God spoke to me. He said, uh, he said, and I understood my father fought in Vietnam, but my heavenly father says, I am fighting for Vietnam and I need you to go. You can, you can feel, I've got this good church, Pastor. No, no, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to plan. Hey, that's good. But you better ask yourself, is it just that I don't want to have to dig deep? I've been doing this a long time. And I'm going to tell you, every once in a while, I see people, and I thought, man, keep an eye on that guy. You could see the trajectory. But sometimes you see the trajectory plateau. Because at some point, they say, the house, the well, the plant. Let's close. I want to talk to you about God and hidden treasure, and we'll stop. Because hidden treasure is for him, not us. All the surface stuff is for us. Thank God. God blesses you. He wants you to have a good home, a happy family. He wants you to enjoy. I, I'm not against that. I want you to be blessed. When people in my church come to me and say, Pastor, we bought a new car. I'll go out of the parking lot, and I'll say, man, praise God. I'm happy for you. If we bought a home, I have to glory to God. I'm happy for you. And God will do that. I'm not knocking that. But if you think about it, the treasure he's talking about wasn't for them. It was for him. He wanted a temple to be built. It says, when you have eaten and are full, verse 10, then you shall bless the Lord your God 
for the good land which he has given you, you shall bless the Lord your God. He says that the hills have copper, the rocks have ore. He says, you will take those resources and you'll bless me. I want to tell you, our gifts are not for us to be a personal success. Our gifts are all for the purposes of God what he has for us. They were going to build a temple. I want to say this evening, there's an incredible challenge in front of us right now. Thank God for everything he's done, but our conferences are not pep rallies. We're here tonight to do business. Tomorrow night and Friday night, you're going to have exciting announcements because you and I are here to do business, and as we look in front of us, the prospect of planting missionaries, sending out workers other parts of America, all the challenges of ministry that are in front of us. Let's be honest, unless we dig deeper, we're not going to be able to do it. All the resources that are available right now are not going to do it. We have to go deep. Or eventually we're going to run out of the ability to do what we're doing. In the book Undaunted Courage, there's a very powerful statement that's made about Meriwether Lewis, you know, the, he's leading these, this uh, group of about 30 men, and they've they're, they're been sent by, by Thomas Jefferson to cross to the Pacific Ocean. No American has ever done this. They're there, and it's like traveling to Mars. You know, they're, they're seeing things nobody had ever seen before. They're meeting Indian tribes no one had ever met. They're looking at, at plant life and fauna. They're, they're capturing animals no one had ever seen. And as they're moving across the land, he, uh, Stephen Ambrose makes this statement. He said they were, in, they were in southern Montana, and he had no realize that as he's walking across the land, he is standing above one of the richest gold mines in the world. But he doesn't know it. He's not even looking for it. He's been told, pay attention to the plants, pay attention to the animals, pay attention to the tribes. And he's standing on one of the richest gold mines in the world. He didn't even know it. I'm telling you tonight, there are people here that there's incredible treasure, ministry that God wants to produce through your life. I wonder if we'll come to the end and we'll, we'll, we'll cross over and we'll look back and say, what? It was right there. There are men here, I feel by the Spirit of God, I'm going to put this out there. There are men here that God put a nation on your heart. And there was a time where you, maybe you told people, maybe you didn't. And you said, man, I'm, I'm going, I'm, we're going to do this. But now you've got the house and the well and the farm. And you keep pushing that back. God says, go out and get it. You know, when they built the temple, that large prospect of, you know, the promised land. If you read the book of Joshua chapter 1, the promised land was far bigger than what is present-day Israel today. And the Bible says that when they begin to build the temple, they begin to get the cedars of Lebanon and the gold of Tyr. Commentators say that it was those copper mines that provided all the tools that were necessary to build the temple. Our motive is to bless God. And if you and I are going to build the third temple, which is the church, we're going to have to get more than we have right now. And that means we have to go deep. It's easier to stay where we are, easier for us to kick back and say, I'm good. But what are we going to miss if we don't go deep? I'll give you one last verse and we'll pray. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12, he says, If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be built by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. I want to leave you with this thought. He says that one day, everything that we have done is going to be brought before God. Those houses were made of wood, hay, and straw. 
the fire comes. The things that endure are not the things that came easy to us, but the things that were down under the surface. Let's bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and we're before God. There's hidden treasure here. There are nations here. There are leadership churches here. There are conference centers here. My challenge to you tonight is to say, God, I have to go deep. Thank God for what you have done, but you are not done with me. You are not done with me. I've seen men who were powerful ministry. And they said, well, you know, I want to be another Pastor Mitchell. I want to be another Pastor Warner. And, but that becomes becoming clear over the years. That's not what it is. But at some point, you, you wondered if they would have just said, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to move from this place of comfort. Not so much in wealth, but just simply, it's, I, I'm at a comfort level here. I can do this. And God says, yeah, you can do it. But there's so much more you could do. And one of the challenges that we face as a fellowship is that we are going to continue to dig deep. And we're not going to be satisfied as where we are and think about what we've accomplished. He says, you're going to one day, you're going to eat, you're going to get full. You're, the, the blessing I've given you, you're full now. You're, I'm good, I'm satisfied. And tonight God is pointing to some mountains. And he is saying, you know where the real treasure is? It's there, but you're going to have to go to work for that. And I'm telling you tonight, there's a incredible ministry here. There are nations that can be reached through the people that are sitting here right now. But are you willing to go deep? One day, church, we're going to cross over. And it's going to be those minerals gold silver precious stones you don't find those on the surface right now while our heads are about is there anybody here to say pastor ruby i'm not right with god i'm sitting here i am not right with god i'm backslidden i came along somebody told me but as i sit here i realize i'm so far away from god i'm so ashamed on the inside of who i am and the things that i've done Tonight, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ died for you. He shed his blood for you. Your sins could be washed away. You could be clean. You don't become a Christian by, by just trying to try harder. You come and you fall on your knees to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I want to tell you, he said, I came seeking sinners. And he'll save you. He'll forgive you. If you're saying, I'm ready to turn. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm tired of my sin. Before I do anything else, you say, Pastor, I need prayer tonight. I want to give my life to Christ. If that's you, I want you to put up your hand right now. Just put it up, hold it there, and by putting your hand up, you're saying, pray for me. I need Jesus. All around this building, put it up. Would you respond? God's dealing with you. I'm holding this for a moment. God's dealing with you tonight. Lift up your hand. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm not right with God. Or I'm a backslider, and I'm ready to repent right now. Here's my hand. While our heads are bowed then, I challenge us to the church. I'm asking you to go deep. I'm asking you to be honest with God. Say, God, are you pointing to a mountain? And you're saying, I have more for you. I have more for you. Don't get full yet. Don't get satisfied with what I've done so far. Let's stand right now. I'm going to open these altars. I'm asking you to come down and get a hold of God. There, are, uh, there I can tell there are men here. God is reminding you of words that you have spoken to him. He is bringing back to you right now dreams that he showed you. And he's pointing to a mountain and saying, hey, there's great treasure right now. If you'll just reach out to it and you'll say, God, I am not going to stop. I am not at a place where I'm saying, okay, I, I'm good now. Every one of us have to be challenged. Shana Mandi Korobo say, let's sing, let's worship God. 
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. God is, uh, I want to just give a moment. God, I believe God is speaking right now to some people, speaking to some men and some couples. Right now, he's showing you something. He's showing you a mountain. He's telling you, go dig. He's showing you a nation, showing you a city. He may be showing you a ministry in your church. You're, 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 you're blessed. Let me describe you. You're blessed. You are a great blessing where you are. You're being affirmed, and you're saying, man, but I, I'm doing good, and look what God's done. And I want you to listen to God tonight, because he's showing you something. You know what he's saying? He's saying there's more. And, you're, and there's a part of us like, man, that, that's a pile of rocks. That's an effort. I'm doing good right where I am. I believe the Spirit of God right now is speaking to people at this altar. This is a holy moment. This is a burning bush. Ah, 
Hallelujah. You obey God tonight. Shana Mandi Korobo said it, my Davli Korobo. Let us say the Lord thy God. Tonight I have reminded you. Have you not forgotten when you told me you would go? When you told me you would support the work? And now before you, there is a challenge. From this place, you will reach the whole world. From this place, I will give you nations. But will you go? You have seen the blessing that I have given you. And I have more for you. But know this. You must dig deep. It is in you. Because I am in you. Yes. And I will go before you. And I will help you. And I will give you the breakthrough. But the challenge is you must go. You must stand. You must support. There is greater things beyond. Thus saith the Lord. Yes. Shana Mandi Korbo Go beyond. Go beyond. Amen. You know, I find myself, you know, I'm thinking about what uh, William was saying. You know, I find myself saying to people, 45, 50 years old, you're young. You're young. Do not limit God and do not limit yourself. There's so much more land to be taken. Can you say amen? Let's give God praise. Our pastor's going to come. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful grace of God upon our service tonight. Uh, as we dismiss, we just want to plug a reminder. Please leave the sanctuary as soon as possible. Uh, make your way outside the church. So that way the cleaning ladies may uh, begin and not stay here late. Amen. And also the, uh, the parking, no parking in, uh, uh, underneath the carport. Just pick up and drop off only. Amen. As we dismiss tonight in prayer, I'm going to ask Pastor Oscar Cruz if he can dismiss us in prayer. <laughs>